If you have material in your sewing stash that you have no idea what the actual content is, you can simply set it on fire. As you can see with the French blue fabric, it ignites quickly and then melts. It has more of a chemical smell than a vinegar smell and it melts into a hard black bead. This fabric is acrylic. The cream chiffon recoils slightly, ignites briefly, and then chars. It smells like burning hair, which of course I know the smell of as I was born in 1980. It burned slowly and then went out. The fabric, not my hair, except that one time. The final result was a soft crushable bead. Therefore, this material is silk. Today we're going back in time to the exact same year as the previous video, 1929. Same Haslam book, just two pages prior. This dress is what I'm going to call my lucky dress. I bought the shoes, I bought the fabric, but years apart had both sort of in the, in the stash. Yes, I have a shoe stash of shoes that I don't have clothing to go with, but were so amazing that I purchased and now I have to sew stuff for them. So that might be another reason why I'm, I'm doing this sewing thing. The shoes are from American Duchess. Go into the description, the link uh, to the shoes, as well as the pattern, as well as any other relevant links are there. The fabric is from a store that has closed years ago. You can't have it. You, the, I have it all and it's now sewn and that's that. It's all mine. I am incredibly uninterested in applying modern concepts and aesthetics of beauty to anything over a hundred years ago. I am looking at the 1920s with the attempt of seeing beauty through that time period. I want to look at the aesthetics and the construction and the way the garment looks on me through that time period's aesthetics. We are still exploring shears and it is still entirely too hot for sleeves. So in many ways, this dress is a repetition of con construction from the last dress. And I'm doing that on purpose because there's nothing quite repetition to help you solidify certain skills in your art. So this is my confidence building lucky dress. While you're in the description box and checking out my links, make sure that you also check me out on Patreon as well as Instagram. And make sure you turn on that subscribe alarm bell thing down there because I really do not post regularly. And the only way that you're gonna remember me is if you have an alert. Before I drafted the pattern, I took a look at uh, Art Deco clothing, a wide range, which funny enough does not actually, in my opinion, begin at 1920. It really starts leaning towards this around 1907. The lack of patterns for this time period and the changes that were going on during that time period to the fashion industry make this a very accessible time period to sew now. If nothing else, Silk sack dresses are insanely easy to make, to wear, incredibly comfortable, and there's no buttons, there's no snaps, there's no zippers, it's just, it goes on. So there's an ease of wearing and sewing. And that was a point of that time period. Now please note that I said silk sack dress. Okay, I'm going to be, cause I have that ability, uh, to try to use as much silk as possible. But what we're really looking at is silky material, things that drape, that hang, that, that flow off the body. I'm going to give you an example of why. And it's going to be a very simple example. I have two videos and am currently wearing it. I look costumey. This hangs badly. It does nothing for my shape. It does nothing aesthetically pretty that is recognizable in any decade. Like this is more design featurey in the sense, sense of how it billows around me. It does not hang off me. It does not drape off of me. The clothing, it, it has consumed me and swallowed me whole. That is not a 1920s aesthetic. The development of synthetic fabrics in this time period heavily influenced the fashion industry. This is important to understand because when we are talking about recreating historical garments, 
the right fabric is essential. The 1920s simplification of garments had two major effects. One was ready-made clothing. The other was do it yourself. The sew it yourself movement is important to note in that up to this point in time, any of your fancy clothing really was reserved for up here. The do it yourself point right after World War I, the tossing of corsets and women ending up doing traditionally men's jobs and then being introduced to for the freedom of pants and then being sent back home and then here's a whole bunch of new fabric but maybe you would like to go out and go dancing even if you are not necessarily the richest human on earth with title and land and everything else i don't know you're human you actually want to have fun it's crazy but even with all of that behind them they had to convince women that it was morally acceptable and if not a duty and uh, of, of domestic responsibility that one can sew for oneself and that your looks is now something that is valued. When you're thinking about sewing at home, this was very much sold as a domestic skill as well as an economic saving boon. Let's talk pattern drafting. So the first thing that I did was take the old dress that had the exact same armholes and transferred any changes that I made, better changes, to the sloper. For anyone deeply inspired and wanting to sew this at home, the back, you can actually cut that out in one piece, but unless you have better sewing skills than me, which is very, very likely, you're going to have problems with putting the trim on there because there's actually no lines and this material likes to move a lot. So in the end, my choice to uh, try to have a smooth line all the way down without any joining, without the, the up and down, because I knew that was gonna be a challenge, so I wanted to reduce the amount of challenges, resulted actually in a reduction of challenges, but also a reduction of trim all the way around. I'm not upset by this. I think this looks perfectly acceptable the way it is. I have decided that all sleeveless dresses are easier for me to construct if I put in a lining. It elevates the garment, it makes it more fancy, and I think it's 10 times so much easier. It is so much easier to sew with a lining. I don't have to do weird things with my, my, my here and here and then the puckering and just, no. I like a lining. The lining is being made with the leftovers from this bed jacket. In the process of making the lining, I realized that this actually contrasted exceptionally well, and I got very, very lucky, and I was able to piece things together because I very much was working with remnants at this point, and I was able to do the collar and the flounce with this. The front bodice and skirt and how they came together was complex. And my hint to anyone who makes this is to plan on creating two dimples right here and here. These actually line up perfectly to where your bust line is, your bust point is. So if you have two dimples right here and you've got your two dimples right here, this material is not necessarily shaped but it is going to fit in a flattering manner. So this is a tube but with subtle tube shaping. The skirt has two plates that go directly into the point. Due to me never wanting to iron a mystery pleat ever again, I absolutely top stitched the folds of the pleats. I also added lace on the inside of the pleat as I am obsessed with the inside of pleats. I also added the trim. This, it was at this point that I realized any concept of getting the trim right on the backside was going to be impossible. You really do need to know your crafty limits. Once I had the back and the front completed, I French seamed the sides of the top layer, but left the neck, hem, shoulders, and armpits alone. I sandwiched the lining to the dress and attached the neckline, the armpit, and the shoulders. Let's talk about the neck flounce detail. This was interesting. It had two fold points on the pattern. Let me show you. I decided to heavily starch and iron the material prior to cutout as chiffon moves a lot, and this was done on the bias, I highly suggest that you draft and cut this about two inches longer in order to give you more playroom with how all of this comes together in the front. I stared at this a lot at this point on this dress, and I finally determined that this flouncy area 
is actually an illusion and that there is not a hole in the dress for this to come through. This is simply sewn in a strategic manner. I finished out the hem with a big wide fancy lace that matches the lace on the inside of the pleats and this is the result.